Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. Before we hear from our guest speaker, Professor Bruce Robinson, it is tradition for the University of Western Australia to acknowledge that it is situated on Noongar land and that the Noongar people remain the spiritual and, cust and cultural custodians of the land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. Winthrop Professor Robinson from our School of Medicine and Pharmacology is an internationally renowned asbestos diseases specialist. Earlier this year, he was awarded Western Australian of the Year and prior to that, made a member in the General Division of the Order of Australia in recognition of his significant service to medicine in the area of research into asbestos-related cancers and to the community, particularly through the support of fathers. At Sir Charles Garden Hospital, Bruce co-leads a large research team studying cancer immunology and asbestos diseases. This team has made many discoveries, including the first blood test for mesothelioma, and has conducted many world first treatments, including Australia's first cancer gene therapy trial. Bruce is also the director of the National Centre for Asbestos Related Diseases, and in this role pioneered the first, world's first effective chemotherapy treatment for mesothelioma. In addition to his work in the medical field, he has consistently contributed to the community by supporting men in their role as fathers. He is the co-founder of the Fathering Foundation, and the best-selling author of a series of books on fatherhood. Deeply saddened by the number of Indonesian tsunami victims, Bruce also spent time learning Indonesian and worked in Aceh, returning to Indonesia more than 20 times. There, he co-founded a course which provides train-the-trainer programs in the region. Bruce is a lung specialist, a researcher, makes significant contribution to the community. His personal philosophy is to, co is to turn compassion into action. His presentation today will address his three journeys in his areas of passion and expertise. Please help me welcome Bruce. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, people, for coming. Can I advance the uh, slides from here? Sorry? Sorry, Mike, I didn't ask that before we started. Just pause for a moment. OK, so I'll just have to put my finger up which the Australian test team have seen quite a bit lately. <laughs> no DRS on this. It's a great, uh, I just walked through the campus today and it's a great pleasure for me to walk through the campus that gave me my head start actually. Um, so a long time ago now. And uh, so I did medicine here and like a lot of people in my era, was the first person in my ever family to do, to go to university. So. Today is about three uh, journeys actually beyond the consulting room. Thanks, Mike. So I just thought I'd tell you uh, what happened when I went, how I chose medicine. Anyone recognise this guy? John Newcomb, yeah, he won Wilmington that year, 1967. Oh, it says it up there. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And this is the... Um, just to show, give you an idea how incredibly immature I was, <laughs> I was going to do nuclear physics, quantum cosmology and all that sort of stuff when I was a year 12 student. I used to love physics and I still do, but this is how fickle I was. I watched an episode of Dr. Kildare and I saw the attractive nurses gazing <laughs> adoringly at the doctor, so I said to my parents, I might switch to medicine. <laughs> See, pathetic. I'm sure the kids walking around the campus today are much more sophisticated than that. Anyway, I did that, and uh, now I'm a doctor. And I'm a specialist, lung specialist, uh, mostly at Charlie Gardner's, a bit at Hollywood, and there I am looking at a CAT scan. And that's my regular job, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I just thought I'd talk about three very interesting journeys, and the principle of my dis discussion is to talk about... Um, yeah, this, how a UWA career can create opportunities to change lives. You can just be a doctor, right, which is fantastic. I love it. Thank God for the profession I have. But these are three extra things I've been able to do. So I begin, uh, as you heard, talking about cancer. So this is a patient who has, uh, this is a chest X-ray of a patient. And where you see black is the lungs. I'm sure I don't have a pointer. Is there a pointer, maybe? Sorry, I should have checked this beforehand. Um, but what you can see, actually, I'll just leave the walk over here. Yep. 
that white thing on the left, left of the patient, your right, is fluid. So that's actually a patient who has a cancer and the fluid has oozed out of the cancer causing what's called an effusion. And uh, when you take those cells out, see those brown stained, what looks like a bunch of grapes, they're cancer cells. And uh, cancer has been a very difficult enemy to cure. And everyone around the world is studying all sorts of cancers. We have a particular interest in Western Australia, which is asbestos cancer. You can see in this rock a vein of blue metal marked, there it is, with asbestos. You can see it's blue, that's blue asbestos. And WA is, has the highest incidence of asbestos-related cancers in the world. It only has, like, like it has about 100 cases a year in WA that come to our hospital. There are 15,000 around the world. We haven't got all of them but they all funnel through Charlie Gardner's, so we have a lot of expertise in that. Next. But why would you bother using asbestos? Everyone knows it's really dangerous. Well, it's really good stuff. It's great for insulation. You put it around pipes and the hot pipes and they stay hot. Uh, houses stay hot, you know, insulation of houses. Next. It's heat resistant, so it fireproofs buildings, you know, so this is fabulous. Why ships have got it everywhere so they don't sort of burn to the waterline. And next, and you can make it into sheets for buildings, which you can't do with stones and things. So brilliant stuff. So it was used everywhere in Australia. We don't have pine forests and things, so we just dug asbestos out everywhere. 3,000 different uses. And we still haven't hit the peak of asbestos cancer. So we have a particular area of interest in that. Next. Just uh, for your education, there's two main sorts of asbestos. There's blue asbestos and next, and white asbestos. And you can see the blue stuff is sort of long and skinny and the white stuff is more curvy and what we call feathery. If you just turn your uh, attention to the top one again, the blue one, you can see that some of those things look like spears. And that's exactly why it's so dangerous. You breathe in blue asbestos like a spear spears its way through the lung into the cells, causes cancer, right the way through the lung to the lining, which I'll show you, I think, on the next. Yeah, so here's a cartoon of a lung. The light blue is the bronchial tubes. The blue is the lung. Next. You can just see the little blue fibres coming into the top as you breathe them in. Next. They penetrate the lung. Next and then they work their way, and you can get two sorts of cancers. One is a cancer of the lung itself, which we call lung cancer, and then it can go right through, as you can see there, to the outside, to the pleura, which you'll be familiar with from pleurisy, etc. It's the casing of the lung, and that causes uh, what's called mesothelioma. Two different, sorts, two different lung cancers, one of the actual lung tissue, one of the casing of the lung. Lung cancer, mesothelioma, and you know, Mesothelioma is kind of famous, and there was just a mini-series on recently, and some of you may have seen it, about Bernie Banton, the asbestos campaign. Remember the guy that used to come on the news with the oxygen in his nose? Who can remember seeing Bernie Banton on the news? Yeah. So he eventually died of mesothelioma, and uh, it's not one of the very good cancers. Next. So just to show you some of the research we've done in that, um, this is a cartoon of cancer cells. The light blue cells are the cancer cells, and those little green things are proteins, tiny, tiny amounts of proteins that escape into the blood. But there's only tiny, tiny amounts. This is like a needle in a haystack. But we've de developed some tests to actually, by very sophisticated technology, to discover these cancers, not by doing an X-ray, but by testing the blood. Next. And next. And here is an example, this is a, uh, a graph showing mesothelioma on the left, MM, malignant mesothelioma, in the amount of this stuff in the blood, the little blue triangles. And all the other patients' controls, etc., are shown in yellow. And you don't have to be a scientist to realise that that is a spectacularly successful experiment. You know, this is a very good blood test, which we discovered actually um, maybe 10 years ago now. It's now used throughout the world. Next. So we published this in The Lancet, which is one of the most famous journals in the world. And then, next. 
And then we got all of this media, because asbestos is very topical. And uh, Aussie breakthrough and all that sort of stuff. And then it's been commercialised and, as I said, used around the world. Just an example of Western Australian research that pff, helps the world. Next. Now, this is a cartoon. This is actually a, not a cartoon. This is actually an, a scanning EM image. <clears throat> you wonder, um, it's all very well to make a diagnosis of cancer, but doctors aren't about just making a diagnosis. We want to fix it. So now I'll just tell you uh, some current research uh, about one way of fixing it. And what we're interested in is getting the immune system to attack cancer. And this picture here, the purple, or the pinky purpley cell, is a cancer cell, and the yellow cell is a killer T cell. We all have killer T cells. They run around the body all the time. That's how we get uh, protected from influenza and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, those killer T cells can kill cancer cells. I mean, they sort of can see a cancer cell almost like a virus because of mutations. So, next. So I went off to America at one stage and did a doctorate in Washington, D.C. I wasn't actually in this particular building, but, <laughs> you know, we never got invited. But I was down the road. Next. And came back with this technology. And just for fun, I thought I'd show you this. We translated this into, uh, you can see now, 25 years ago, it's our first patient we tried with our new immunotherapy. We've tried maybe 10 different sorts. And what you can see there is the size of a skin deposit, a cancer deposit. It was growing, growing, growing until it got to be more than 50 centimetres squared. We gave this recombinant particular molecule that stimulates the killer cells. And you can see that it shrunk. And even when we stopped the treatment, it continued to shrink. And if you look carefully, you'll see on the bottom line, the patient who had a life expectancy of about three months lived for another five years. And this is one of our first immunotherapy clinical trials. And it's why one of the reasons that we're really focused on trying to get the immune system to fight cancer. Next. But how does this killer cell know it's a cancer cell? Well, cancer is full of um, abnormalities in DNA. Anyone know what they're called? Those little abnormalities in DNA, it starts with M. Mutation, that's right. Next. Who knows who these guys are? Watson and Crick, right? So 60 years ago, they uh, identified DNA as the carrier of genetic material and the structure of it. Next. There are, you get three billion letters from, in your genetic code, three billion from your mum and three billion from your dad. So you've got six billion letters in your DNA code. Every cell in your body has six billion letters. And if you uh, just type them out at 10 bases a second, 24 hours a day, it would take you nine and a half years to type out your genetic code. So it's not surprising that people haven't been able to discover what these mutations are. And in particular, from our point of view, to discover what mutations might be targets for these killer cells. And just to point it out, so you've got your DNA, makes RNA, protein, next. There's a mutation in green, and there's one little mutation on that protein, and that is the mutation that we need to identify to get the immune system to attack the cancer. Sounds easy, but I've already told you, six billion bits of information. You're trying to find a needle in a haystack of needles. Next. Uh, so I'm not going to go any more into that because it's complicated, but what you end up with when you... Because we're sequencing the cancer cells. You get sequenced those six billion bases and you work out where the mutations are and which ones might be antigenic. And you end up with this massive bit of information. Next. It's called a circus plot. You identify a bunch of mutations, and out of all of that, with very clever people doing very clever things, you find at the bottom there 15 potential antigens for a vaccine. Next slide. So going back to our patient now, next. You take the cells out, and next, you DNA sequence it, identify the mutations, make a vaccine, and force the immune system to attack the cancer. Everybody's cancer is different. Everybody has different mutations has to be personalised. That's the exciting part of this work. 
So next. <clears throat> so my point is, I mean, I could just go and see those patients and do the best I can, but my point is a UWA career creates extraordinary opportunities to change lives. And we're not the only ones in the world trying to do this, but it's very exciting work. <clears throat> very exciting indeed. And it is the cutting edge. It's this technology out of the human genome project. <clears throat> so that's one thing we do. Go inside the cancer cell. Okay, that's the end of journey number one. Now, journey number two, next. Well, here I am back in my consulting room. <laughs> nice bow tie. I only put it on for the photo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I did anyway. Look, uh, so next. <clears throat> okay, so I'm a, a lung specialist, and lung cancer is the commonest lethal cancer, and I have patients who come to see me, men, <clears throat> And uh, this is one of them, Peter. He doesn't, doesn't mind me showing his photo. And he, like many of them, said to me, when I chat to them, you know, I've only got six months to live and I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. So, you know, that's what, they, that's what men say. But I'm going to show you the next one that they say next. <clears throat> I wish someone had helped me see, see that when I was young and busy. When you're young and you're driven, <clears throat> work and everything seems a lot more important to you than when you look back it ever really was. If only someone had helped me. And of course in uh, the olden days we had elders and tribal elders and our grandfathers to help us, but now we live in suburbs and flats and things and there's no one there to tell us. So we just, we end up getting cancer at 50 or 60 and then living with regrets. So we set up the fathering project next. And that's because it wasn't just to help dads, it's to help kids. Kids are at huge risk nowadays, risks that people in the audience don't even, aren't even aware of. Substance abuse, binge drinking, teenage pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, loss of values. I mean, everyone used to go to Boy Scouts and they had scripture classes at school, maybe went to Sunday school, you know, and all sorts of inputs. Kids hated listening to it, but nap, 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 but at least they had a lot of values. You know, but nowadays kids have what's so-called a loss of a values compass. Teenage depression, suicide. I don't know if you know this, but 48% of Western Australian 17-year-olds have used illegal drugs. And just in case you think that's marijuana, 16% have used amphetamines, just to pick one. So if you just think of all those kids out there, so all those 17-year-olds out in Western Australia, 16%. Next. <clears throat> so we set up the fathering project. Next. And uh, people say to us, oh, it's great, Bruce, you set up the fathering project to help dads. Because, as I said, you don't want to have guys living with regrets. But I remind people that we didn't set it up for the dads. We set it up for children. Next. Because if you look at a father and their effect on a child, well, actually... <clears throat> We're trying to help fathers to help the children. It's all about the children and their future. Like, to be honest, blokes, I'm sorry to say this, but mums, on average, do a pretty good job. Working mums, non-working mums, disabled mums, you know, sole parent mums, they do a pretty good job. There's something about mothers and children that, on average, their performance is way up here. And whilst there's plenty of dads who job, on average, well, certainly very variable, shall we say. So we're trying to help dads. Next. Because, statistically, just to summarise, there's about a 50% reduction in risk of substance abuse, depression, bad school attitudes and behaviour, that's bad attitude to the school, to the teachers and to other kids, and to learning itself, and crime. On average, a 50% reduction if they have a strong and appropriate father figure. We well, just think about that for a moment. You know, all the risks that our children face getting worse and worse in Australia, if every child in Australia, which is our vision, had a strong and appropriate father figure, 50% reduction in all of those things. I mean, how exciting is that? That's why we're doing it. Next. And we don't just talk about dads because some kids either don't have a dad or the dad's just not interested. So we focus on father figures. Next. Like grandfathers, we give them skills, how they can speak into a child's life, uncles, stepfathers, 
school teachers, sports coaches. The power of a father figure, especially when the regular dad isn't interested or not there, is very, very strong. Next. So, you know, written a few books, we've made some DVDs, we've got a whole project based here at UWA trying to get out and talk to dads. Next. So we've actually talked to 13,000 dads, live, audience. And if anyone uh, knows men here, it's very hard to get men into a room. They always say to their wives or partner, you know, well, you go, honey, and you just come back and tell me what I need to know. You read the book, <laughs> you read the book and tell me what I need to know. I mean, I did that too. <clears throat> so we've had 13,000 dads live, plus so many more through the website and emailing and six different countries, social media, fathers' groups, campouts. It's already been very powerfully effective. Next. So what do we do? We, we, we roll it out to school. So we do a lot of stuff in schools. They get their dads together, form a dads' group, and the aim is to have it in every school in the country. But we have special target groups as well. Next. FIFO workers, big problem there. We're doing some stuff with FIFO dads. Next. Aboriginal father figures, very exciting project because of the power of the father figure in Aboriginal culture, speaking to young people. Dads and health, there's an obese child eating chips and watching TV. Obesity in children's a problem. We've got doing things about exercise and healthy lifestyle. Next. Education, I mentioned. Um, commonest uh, relationship for a kid who's a bully, for example, is a uh, father figure is not speaking appropriately into his life. The absence of a father figure speaking appropriately. And we're going to this, the goal is everywhere in Australia. Next. So we have all sorts of tips, but he, one of our best tips is how to create special times with kids. And there you can see a dad with his kid at the beach. Top right is a dad uh, on a dad date with their child. We push that and that's been miraculously effective. Camping trip and bottom right is a longer trip. We talk about taking the kids on trips and so many stories of um, wonderful outcomes. Oh, I'll just tell you one. Oh, just there's hundreds of them, but I mean, this happened to be in my profession. I went to a conference in the East, I can't remember where, but the um, president of this society, this is my pulmonary society, thoracic society, saw me at the uh, registration desk and came running up to me, and he said, oh, Bruce, I've got to tell you something. I've been waiting for you to come in. He said, I read that section in your book about taking your kids on trips. He said, I had a conference in Paris. No. He said, my 14-year-old daughter and I were, you know, can happen with 14-year-old girls. <laughs> and I read that chapter, so I said, oh, I'll take her to Paris with me. So she, because it was Paris, she said yes. <laughs> five days conference, total two weeks. So five days in, another nine days. He said, you know, Bruce, ever since then, she's, she and I have been like this. We've got our own secret stories about, you know, silly things we did. And here's the thing, he said, she keeps telling people, it's the best two weeks of her life. And he said, you know what, Bruce, best two weeks of my life too. That's one of many stories where people's fathering has been changed. And here's the thing, here's the thing. It's not about the father, it's the 14-year-old girl I think about, you know, when, when they get, go through that angry phase, they can do all sorts of things as an act of rebellion. And there's a very thin line between having fun and having a catastrophe in adolescent life. So I think about her. And I remember, I'll tell you another story too, just thinking about these stories, but I interviewed a girl who was a recovering drug addict. She was mid-twenties, but she described her life, and, and what made me think about it is she's also an angry 14-year-old. She said, I got really angry when I was 14. I don't know why I got angry. Just got angry with everybody. Started to rebel. She said, I started to go out drinking, and then we started smoking pot, and I ended up on heroin. And then she said, um, you know, she said, I don't blame my dad. I don't blame him. You know, it's my responsibility. I'm not the sort of person now, I'm an adult, I don't blame him. I knew he loved me, but he just didn't know what to do. If only he'd reached out and hugged me, probably I wouldn't have been a drug addict. You know, it's the difference between one thing and another, those two stories. And that's what the Fathering Project does. It tells dads what to do before there's a catastrophic outcome. 
So you can see why it's terrific. Anyway, next. But, you know, why do you need a fathering project? Why do you need one? Like, there wasn't one, you know, you don't read about one in 17th century England, no, the fathering project based in the Houses of Parliament, you know, so why do you need one? Well, just to explain the, de the change in society, this is the last 200 years, next. So kids' needs and risks have increased, that's the blue line. Kids' needs and risks have increased. Let's get that really clear. Next, what am I talking about? Drugs, binge drinking, stuff that really wasn't too much around when I was a kid. Obesity. God, we ran feral around the neighbourhood. No one was fat when I was a kid, maybe one, you know, but... Sexual pressure, you know, including pornography. I mean, 12-year-olds addicted to pornography because they know how to get onto the internet. And mostly it's accidental. They get trapped by the people who push pornography. You know, it's like, for example, um, the website, thewhitehouse.com, was pornography peddlers you do this sort of, there's all sorts of tricks but that's one but well, thewhitehouse.com is a pornographic site they, they bought that domain name because kids who are doing their homework the correct site is thewhitehouse.gov so they figure let's cap and they capture kids that way and then when the kid tries to back out of it it's called mouse trapping and they can't get out of it because they won't won't let them go back out of it. and then they lose all their homework so anyway uh, school behaviour, bad, you know, you know, I'm sure you know this, you read it in the paper. School teachers are quitting because of the bad attitude of children. Cyberbullying, teenage depression, suicide, I mentioned the values. So these are massive challenges to our kids. It's quite a dangerous world for our kids. Next. At the same time, a father's capacity to respond to those needs has declined. Why? Next. Fathers are spending more time at work now. Dads used to work nine to five, come home. They may not have been all that great, but at least they were home. Less help from the family. <clears throat> As I said, people live in the suburbs. So families used to live near each other. I mean, for the whole of human existence, people have lived in tribes. You were near <coughs> your brothers. In other words, the kids had uncles and grandfathers all around. I mean, here's a, who here lives within one kilometre of their parents. Well, I'm probably in the same house up there, you know. <laughs> no, it's just that, um, you know, people move. So that sort of tribal sense that kids have other people to listen to is gone. You're isolated. So dads have less help from the family. <clears throat> and let's face it, if their dad was no good, how are they going to learn to be a dad? It's just a repeating cycle. <clears throat> and obviously divorce and separation, 26% of kids in Western Australia go to sleep without one parent in the house. And less good role models, this is that same repeating cycle. So there's a gap between what kids need and uh, what fathers can deliver. <clears throat> That's why we do what we do. So the fathering project <clears throat> closes that gap. You can see why there's a compellingly strong case to do this. Next. Okay, does it make any difference? I'm just going to play a little bit of a DVD. Like we go out to schools, right? Does it make any difference? I've told you a couple of stories. I'll just play a DVD now, Mike. Thanks. <clears throat>
journey to along with his father in session. I didn't think too much of it at the time, but after going and, and, and realising there was so much more, uh, it's now completely changed my life, my outlook on, on where I am and what I do. Um, I, I've implemented things in my life completely, which completely changes what I would have normally done. Uh, I'm happy with my life as a family. Uh, I believe I've got, a, I've got a better relationship with my wife and definitely got a better relationship with my boys, boys through it. This just completely changed my life for the better. I, I can't thank the Father in Session enough for what they've done for me personally and as a family and what they've done to us as a family unit. Uh, I just feel very grateful. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Mike. What I love about that is, uh, and you will have noticed this straight away, like sometimes when you do things with men, some women a little bit tetchy, but women love what we do. They love their kids and they want the kids to have, even sole parent mums, maybe have a bit of aggro with, the, with their ex, want their kids to have the best, best chance. And when I think about this guy, I, I look at his kids again. His, the stats on those kids, they've just... The risks have gone down dramatically because of the dramatic change in that family. So we have lots of those stories. Makes a big difference. Next. So, as I said, a UWA career can create extraordinary opportunities to change lives. That's the second journey. And the final journey now. Well, here I am again. <coughs> so this all comes out of being a doctor, you see. Uh, and uh, next. So you wake up in the morning, and this is the sort of thing you, you find out. Indonesian earthquake, if you read the news this morning or heard it, there's a, another volcano going off in Indonesia as we speak. Every year there's something going on. So next, and uh, you know, here's a tsunami. In our time zone, most of these things happen next. And uh, you know, they affect people. Actually, this picture on the right reminds me of how I got involved in the Indonesian Aceh, the tsunami. I was camping with my family. So it happened on Boxing Day, but I didn't volunteer. I mean, you never quite know at the beginning. And we were camping, and, when the, and the statistics just continued to go up. I mean, we ended up at a quarter of a million people, but got to about 60,000. But I heard an ABC report that talked about all the kids. And like this little kid, kids can swim in Indonesia. Often the parents can't. So there was a massive number of kids that had been made orphans. Um, and then, you know, when the water subsided and they let go of the tree and everything in uh, Indonesia, but also in Sri Lanka and all the other places that were affected, they went back and their whole family's dead. And that's because, of course, they all lived together in the same little area. Grandparents, parents, brothers, sisters, whatever. Uh, so a lot of orphans. And I just wept, actually. And I, I do have a tropical medicine and public health diploma from when I was young, so I put my hand up and volunteered. And uh, as Sue said, I've been back more than 20 times. But anyway, next. People think, you know, what's wrong with the tsunami? Can't you just, like, swim? You know, everyone's been to the beach. And... So just play that one, Mike, thanks. So you can see, uh, you know, it's full of dirty water and people inhale all this water and the bits of... Wood, look at all the bits of wood and how fast that's flowing down the main street of Banda Aceh. Cars tumbling, you just can't survive in that. And uh, you don't actually see much footage out of Banda Aceh, but you do, mostly it's tourists that let you know when there's a disaster because they get affected. Not in such great numbers, but of course they're all texting their mums and dads. And Next. You just play that one, thanks Mike. So there's a tour, this is in Thailand now, and you can see this is now a tourist area and you can see that they're also being affected. And uh, I used to think, you know, like, they're just tourists, but in fact, of course, they're the ones who create the interest in the news and get donations to help the poor people who have no other way of letting anyone know. Next. So here's the tourists again, next. And they get affected in various ways, and, you know, we respond. Next. But 
Responding, remember, isn't about the dead people. It's about the survivors. And we respond because when you think about a disaster, it's people. The survivors are people and you respond out of compassion. And remember, Indonesia is our neighbour. When you think about loving your neighbour, I mean, I could just about stand on the beach and if I could see over the horizon, I would have seen the tsunami-smashed shores of Aceh. They are our neighbour. It didn't seem morally right that I would sit around in my campsite anymore drinking wine and playing with the kids and not helping, so I went. Next. Yeah, so went and helped, because not only are people suffering, but, you know, their health system is usually smashed, hospitals and clinics, and in Arche, a third of all the doctors and nurses were actually killed in the tsunami, so, I mean, this couldn't mount. It's a lot more sick people, ran out of antibiotics straight away, people were dying everywhere, you know, so. The right-hand side is actually in Haiti, I went there as well after the earthquake. Next. And this is actually an example, this is actually a picture from Padang in Sumatra where I worked after their earthquake and you can see the health clinic behind is collapsed and all the bricks and rubble are around. And so I'm part of a team that goes and just looks, most of what you do to be honest is uh, ordinary health care because people are still getting pneumonia and everything. They would have got it if there was no tsunami. So some of it, or, or earthquakes, so Early on, you're dealing with inhaled tsunami water and fractures from buildings going down and, you know, terrible things. But then after a while, you're just helping the people until they can get back on their feet. And that's what this picture illustrates. Next. This is actually a place called Loch Root. The whole town was smashed. Here I am actually landing on a road. Uh, no cows or anything on the road, fortunately. A tsunami water either side. And uh, it's actually a bit of fun. Mostly, it's, mostly, to be honest, it's emotionally draining to do this sort of stuff. But it's quite exciting as well, jumping in helicopters and all that sort of stuff. Next. Um, that's just responding to disasters. Uh, in addition, we also go and help poor people in a non-disaster situation. In other words, where every day is a disaster because they just don't have good health care. And I just thought I'd tell you about this girl. This is up in, uh, it doesn't matter, it's in Indonesia, a poor village, dirt poor. And I remember this day because we had 676 patients and there were only three doctors. Anyway, this cute little girl came to see me, she had a sore ankle. And sometimes, you know, there's nothing, but I had a look at her ankle and you can see me holding her ankle and you don't have to be a doctor to realise that's a very swollen ankle joint. In fact, it was hot and red and painful and swollen. And it, she had actually had an infected ankle joint because she was running through the grass and a satay stick, a used satay stick, punctured her ankle. She'd had a week of amoxil and this is a month later. And here's the thing. I looked at this girl and looked at this ankle and I thought the following. I can see her whole life being played out in front of me now. She has not had adequate treatment. That ankle joint will be eroded by the white cells and she will become a cripple. If she's a cripple, she won't get a husband, probably. If she doesn't get a husband, this is a Muslim culture, she won't have kids and she'll be, you know, in the village, she'll be helping whatever for the rest of her life. But she will not get a husband and she will not get children, probably. And she'll limp and she won't be able to work in the fields. And I could see her whole life being played out. So I said to the guy, she needs the following two antibiotics and she needs a full six weeks. And I thought, that's the difference you can make. That is the difference you can make. Her whole life is changed because of that event. Next. So just uh, as I mentioned, eight... So this is a, actually a map of Western, of Australia and Asia and that's a colour-coded thing of all the natural disasters in the world. The point is 80% of them happen within our time zone or roughly within our time zone. See the red dots Perth and you can just see where the natural disasters are happening. So this gives us an opportunity, particular opportunity in Western Australia to help. Next. And so... Um, so, so we can respond as individuals, but the Faculty of Medicine here at UWA 
and the Department of Health, State Department of Health, got together, print, they're the two main partners, and formed a, a group called the, you can see at the top there, the International Skills and Training Institute in Health. And we provide help, mostly training, and you can see us uh, providing training there. And we train people. So it's sort of what we call the stone in the pond approach. We go and we train 100 people. And then they go and train 100 people, right? And that's now 10,000 people trained. But if you just do one thing yourself, that's only one person. So it's the stone in the pond approach. And we set up clinical training in various countries in Southeast Asia. Bottom right, you see this thing called Volunteers for Health. People who want to volunteer, nurses, doctors, they click on there, they log in. And if, for example, they're going to Cambodia for a week's holiday, they might take another week or so and be volunteering in some villages, giving TB vaccines or something. Next. And that's some of the places that we've been working. Next. Various contracts, all sorts of work we've been doing. Next. Here's training. That's me at the top left. You can see me teaching some Indonesians how to do bronchoscopy, which is a, a technique of putting an instrument into people's lungs to look in there. And various other training courses we've been running. Next. So let me finish by just saying, look, here I am. I'm a doctor. I've got a UWA medical degree and a bunch of other ones as well. And I could spend my life doing that as well. And, you know, people who do that, great. But the point of this talk is to say that, and I guess partly because I am probably, be, probably because I am a UWA academic, uh, I, I, if you like, I get freedom to, to do things. How shall I say this? If you're busy five days a week seeing patients, you don't have the time, energy or freedom to do new things. But universities are about breaking new ground. You know, universities are about new knowledge, new ideas, and passing on those ideas, which we call teaching. That's what a university is about. So I'm in a university, and in my medical career, I've been able to have these three journeys in addition to my regular medical practice. The journey into the cell, <coughs> trying to cure cancer, basically. Next. Journey into the community, you know, University of Western Australia acting into the community to try to change the future of our children. And then amongst our neighbours, our poor neighbours, creating things that help our poor neighbours in a really effective way. So my kind of takeaway message, and this is my last comment, is that a UWA career can create extraordinary opportunities to change lives. I mean, I'm very grateful for having had uh, that opportunity. It gives me a very rich and fulfilling life. And uh, thank you for listening to my three journeys. We're almost out of time, and I, we could probably have time for one question, maybe, or two, but that's it. Uh, then we've got to clear the room. But I will hang around outside if anyone wants to talk about anything. And if anyone wants to volunteer for any of these things, get on the website and volunteer. Any particular questions? Yeah. To be honest, that's a great question. And someone asked me on a TV the other day, and I said, look, I'm not such a noble spirit that I either knew anything about this. I mean, I grew up in Bassendine. When I was in fifth year medicine, I'd never been anywhere. One trip to Bunbury, one trip to Geraldton. <coughs> never even been outside the state. And some mentors sent me off to Nepal to do my elective to the Himalaya. I didn't even want to go. I didn't care about the poor. I had a girlfriend at the time, it was kind of inconvenient. I worked in this hospital, in the poor hospital in Western Nepal. Changed my life. So, for example, there was an English doctor who was a surgeon and an American doctor who was a physician, highly trained. And I said to these guys once, they're very impressive, they were there with their you know, young wives and kids and what have you. Very sacrificial, caring for hundreds and hundreds of poor people every day. I said, guys, for a medical student like me, it's really, you know, it's very impressive. You know, you've given up lucrative careers to come and serve the poor. And they sort of said, oh, thanks. And I said, well, but at least you've got the gratitude of the poor, you know, for your soul. They looked at each other and looked at me and they said, uh-uh. 
It doesn't work like that. In order to, to, keep, to give them their dignity, the poor people, to give them some dignity and not to feel like it's charity, we charge them the equivalent of two cents a day. And they actually think we're here to make money out of them. You don't do something for the gratitude of the poor. You do it because it's the right thing to do. So 50 in medicine changed my life. So it's really people around you. I mean, why do I bother you know, talking to audiences? And yesterday I went down to the fourth year medical student camp and actually just talked about the disaster work. I want other people to get a glimpse of what you can do, just like I was lucky enough to have a mentor, two mentors that, in a sense, you know, pushed me onto a plane and got me. They knew what effect it would have, but I didn't. So that's pretty much, I think, how it happens to most people. I mean, we take people with us to the third world when, you know, work with the poor. They don't sort of really want to go, but I nag them and they go. After a week, when can I come back? You know, when can I come back? Anyway, I think we need to finish now, but uh, again, thanks very much. <coughs>